Hey, good morning, First Unitarian Denver. This first Sunday of 2021, and thank you to Elisa Erickson for offering our prayer today. We're beginning this year with a series on the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism, which are in the process of being amended and will soon be eight principles. We're going to dedicate a Sunday, uh, a Sunday morning to each one of these in turn over the next couple months. And in case you're not familiar with the principles, they are the essential covenant of our faith, and it reads as follows. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, respect for the interdependent web of all existence, of which we are a part. And the soon-to-be eighth principle reads like this, journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. A lot of words. These principles, these aspirations are the essential covenant that all Unitarian Universalist congregations and communities agree to, at least in spirit. A very quick review of covenant, just to be clear what we're talking about. Notice that these are not beliefs, and nowhere do they say we believe, or you're going to go to hell if you don't believe. They don't say anything like that. As I mentioned, they are aspirations that we mutually agree upon. And there are three, I believe, underlying theological understandings that support the principles. They're not listed or articulated, but they are there nonetheless. First, it's the assumption, the understanding that we enter this covenant of our own free will. There's no threat of any kind implied or explicit in any of this. The self-determination of every individual is core to Unitarian Universalist spirituality. Second, we understand that this and all covenants are living documents. They invite us into a living dialogue with our deepest values. They are intentionally not static or written in stone. And we have a complicated process for changing them or amending them. And that's actually happening right now with the proposed eighth principle. And third, None of this implies any kind of uniform, robotic, or literal acceptance of every last word. We are perfectly free to examine, critique, or refine these words as we see fit. And as you'll see, I personally have a significant issue with several of the principles, beginning with the first one, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, which is the subject of my comments today. So, without further ado, here goes. The inherent worth and dignity of every person, every person, no exceptions. Spiritually, this articulation, this idea comes straight out of the universalist side of our tradition. Universalists in the 1700s didn't think hell was biblically justified and that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross atoned even for original sin. We were all going to be saved. They read their Bible to say God was a loving God, and every one of us, every one of us, is a beloved child of God, will ultimately be reconciled with God. Here at First Unitarian, our own version of that first principle is on the wall of our sanctuary right behind me. All souls are sacred and worthy, which is a fine phrase and a very tall order. But I want to look closely now at the language of the first principle. The inherent worth and dignity of every person, because let's be honest, I don't think anyone really believes it. I don't. Do we really think that Adam Lanza, who murdered 21 school children, and Adolf Hitler, and Ted Bundy, and pedophile priests, and the people who direct and commit systemic, intentional rape and torture in the prisons of North Africa, the Middle East, and parts of Asia, do we really think all those people have inherent worth and dignity? 
Hmm. I'm not sure we even think that about some of our least favored American politicians and the voters who support them and in some cases apparently quasi-worship them. At the very least, I think if we're honest, we all struggle with this idea mightily, at least to the extent that we think about it much. Please stay with me here because this is important. Reverend Bill Scholes, who served as executive director of Amnesty International for nine years, speaks of his time traveling the world trying to get political prisoners released and speaks bluntly of the many things he saw around the world that he wished he hadn't seen. And Reverend Scholes makes clear that with only a few exceptions, torturers in this world are not madmen or sociopaths or even hardened criminals. He points out that even the most callous regimes out there will weed out the misfits and unstable personalities because those people don't follow orders very well. He points out, and I quote, it's remarkably easy to turn an average Joe into what most of us would regard as a monster. You put him in a restricted environment like a police military training camp or something like that under the command of an authority figure, you subject him to intense stress, like severe beatings and starvation or not being able to permitted, not being permitted to defecate for like 15 days at a time, and then having created an angry, bitter, but obedient servant. You provide the sanction and the means and the opportunity and the rationale for that servant to take his outrage out on a vulnerable person. You tell him, these are the people who are threatening our country. These are the people who are killing your comrades. So just who is this fragile, malleable creature of inherent dignity who can be so easily led to monstrosity? Cut into the chase like Bill Schultz. I don't believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Inherent implies some universal, ineradicable quality, which try as I might, I just don't see in child molesters or torturers or terrorists. Sometimes I don't even see it in myself. On what possible grounds could such a proposition be defended with any reasonable definition of worth and dignity? On the other hand, and here's where I've been heading with all this, I believe the idea, the practice, and the policy, the spirituality of assigning every person worth and dignity may be the highest, the most noble, most necessary ideal that human beings have ever, ever come up with. And you might think I'm picking nits here or getting bogged down in semantics, but if truth is healing and powerful, then the language we use should be truthful. One last thought. And I am shamelessly planting a seed here for further discussion among our community. This banner on our wall reads, All souls are sacred and worthy. Beautiful. But I've been thinking lately that this language is more abstract than our times call for, not just spiritually, but in terms of social justice. Souls are a lovely idea, and most of the time I'm very happy to use that language and think of all the precious souls I have had the honor to know and work with. But I've been persuaded, strongly persuaded, by ta Coates that maybe souls misses something too important to miss in our troubled times. A few weeks ago, I preached about bodies and I drew heavily on ta Coates in his book, Between the World and Me, in which he consistently, maybe brilliantly, keeps the focus on bodies. So when he talks about stop and frisk, it's not an abstraction. He's talking about living bodies who are stopped and harassed and humiliated in public. And when he talks about substandard schools in urban areas across the country, he's talking about the physical, squirmy, beautiful bodies of small children that have to sit on those chairs and who are taught not to think or to grow, but essentially to sit still and behave 
who know damn well that where their bodies live is nothing like where the bodies of white kids on television live. And when he talks about the statistics of black people being arrested more often than white people despite similar levels of crime and how black people receive harsher sentences than white people for the same crimes and who receive the death penalty far and away more often than white people, he is, of course, talking about bodies that breathe and bleed and have heartbeats. And when he talks about redlining, and the impossibility black families have had to access government-backed home loans that are readily available to white families. He's talking about bodies physically restricted from escaping generational poverty by a barrier every bit as effective as if they were steel bars. You get the idea. Racism and white supremacy culture is only an abstraction if you're not black. And if you are black, then all of these are existential, physical obstacles and direct threats to your bodily health, well-being, and the freedom of your body. So I'm wondering, and I invite us to wonder as a community, if changing that banner to read, all bodies are sacred and worthy, might communicate something a little more imperative a little more focus and clarity for why we insist on social justice. To wrap this up, what all this means is that we who wish to be builders of and participants in a loving, inclusive, blessed community do not necessarily have anything inherent in the world to draw upon. If the loving community of souls is truly our goal, then we have to assign worth and dignity at the physical and the spiritual level and make real the holiness of our aspirations. The truth is that these will be created out of the raw and sometimes quite unholy material of our lives and our souls. So while I hold out the possibility of divine comfort or assistance, it seems clear that the initiative to make this real, to make it truthful, is going to come from within us, from within me, and from within you, each of us bound to our flesh, choosing to be bound to one another, holding fast to our desire for a better world where people have worth and dignity because the world that we create demonstrates worth and dignity, no exceptions. Amen.